This is First You Hustle, a podcast from the Columbus College of Art and Design meant to help students and budding creative professionals put their expertise to use. I'm Jordan Bell, and today I, along with you, will be listening in on a great conversation about interior design, architecture, and how great design comes from a collaboration between these two disciplines. At CCAD, our interior architecture and design program prepares students for working in a broad range of the field, from commercial design to retail space, hotels, municipal development, residential, and much more. At M&A Architects, they take design to the next level, and their work is seen everywhere we live, work, play, learn, and recover. So it only makes sense to put all these great minds in one room and turn the microphones off. I'm Kelly DeVore. I'm the Department Chair for Interior Architecture and Design here at CCAD. And I'm Seth Oakley, Director of Cincinnati Operations uh, for MA Architects. And I am Carrie Boyd, a Principal at MA Architects and also the Director of Interior Design. And you just won an award, right, Carrie? I did, 40 under 40, which is super exciting. (laughs) Congratulations. Thank you. It's everything you'll need to know about the future of the industry and how to get prepared. And on that matter, they have lots of advice. For an intern, being able to hop around and get those different experiences will help them understand where they really want to take their The best piece of advice he gave me was take a stab in the dark. It's not just about interior design and architects. I feel like the more you can think holistically about design, period, the better Mm -hmm. off you are. You know, they don't know something. They don't want to try it because they're going to screw up. And I was like, well, you might screw up, but you're not going to screw up completely. You're going to screw up a little bit, but the part that's right is what we can build on. So let's turn things over to Kelly DeVore and her conversation with Carrie and Seth. So from your experience running a firm with both architecture and interior design, um, can you guys talk about how that works um, and the competitive advantage that gives you um, at your firm? Absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, At MA, we get involved in a lot of different project types from mixed use to residential to office, higher ed, healthcare. And so I I feel that all the projects that we are involved with, um, you know, that synergy between architecture and interior design is so incredibly important. Actually, Seth, um, as he already said, is out of the Cincinnati office, and a lot of his work is our multifamily work. And what's interesting about that is that's really building from the inside out. You really set your units first, um, and then interior sort of leads that process, and mm-hmm. then the shell is sort of built around it. And so I think that's kind of the most drastic case where it's really building from the inside out, and it's so important that we're working hand in hand, not only with our architects, but with our engineers, um, with all of our consultants. So I think having both architects and designers under one roof is um, essential, to be honest. I, I'm not sure how firms do it without having them integrated, but right. apparently it happens. Well, <laughs> and. I've had clients notice the, that the integration leads to a better end product. Um, we've had, you know, clients since we started the office down there in 2014. We're new to the market, so we're introducing, you know, working with clients um, for the first time, mm-hmm. and they see our process and how it differs from other architects and interior designers' processes that they've worked with, and mm-hmm. and they think and and really know that it does lead to higher quality work on both sides, and thus we get another project with them. Mm-hmm. And so they really lean on each other, right? I mean, Absolutely. Oh, as much how, as possible. How that process is. There's no separation between um, that's a great that yeah. in. I, I mean, I think that's something that um, I struggle to explain to our students, right? So they come in knowing what interior design is from um, what they see on HGTV. Yeah. <laughs> we love that. <laughs> we, we do like, I like HGTV yeah, I too. too. Um, but you know, how they work together and how they lean on each other, I think is important to explain yeah. too. I, that's, um, I'm glad you're bringing that up again um, in reinforcing it again. You know, when I started at MA in 2007, um, there really wasn't a, a full department, but, um, and, and I think there still are a lot of firms out there that have this, um, this mentality that interior design is just finished selection. Mm-hmm. And, and it's a lot more than that. And it's not that we're trying to be architects there, that we just have to do a better job understanding the strengths that architects have and they bring to the table and the strengths that interior designers have. And, and really, I think it's when we let those, that ego go a little bit and just understand it's okay that I don't know what you know right. and you don't know what I know but right. let's work together and make a stronger team mm-hmm. um, I don't know why there's always been this this sense of one's better than the other because it's not the case um, right. you they're know different. they're very different and and of course no disrespect but 
I didn't grow up wanting to be an architect. I mm-hmm. wanted to be an interior designer. And yeah. and I love that we have the ability yeah. to work collectively together. I mean, there's so many times when Seth and I will collaborate on something and he brings something up that I hadn't thought of. And it's just that different perspective that mm-hmm. uh, we all need and should be hungry for. Right. You know, I started in M- at MA in 2004, so I predate Carrie. I predate really having a full-service interiors department. And to see her and what she's created has really, mm-hmm. you know, kind of completely opened my eyes. I think I, I'll admit that I was one of the old school that thought, oh, they're just, you know, color pickers. And Carrie and everyone that she's brought on has shown me that I was so wrong. And, right. uh, yeah, the, 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 the way they think about design, the way that interior designers – plan space um, is so much different than what I'm used to and how I was taught. Mm -hmm. And it just brings, you know, so much more to the table when you can do it together. Yeah. Carrie, how many um, interior designers do you have on your team? Um, We have 13. So it's a good size. Yeah. 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 So from a student perspective, um, what is the advantage to try to expose yourself to both interior design and architecture or you know how do you how do you um, handle that understanding as you grow as a student would you say because I think both of you guys have different educational backgrounds too yeah I think um, understanding what each uh, each discipline does Mm -hmm. is super important I think um, I, I think you know exposing yourself to that working in firms that offer both together is, yeah. you know, that's the ideal situation because you can see it firsthand. If not, you know, get internship, get experience before you graduate working in both kinds of office. I worked in six different firms around the country yeah. and just just in architecture firms that had interior, I just got to see so many different things that that breadth of experience was extremely mm-hmm. useful in making my career decisions after I graduated. Yeah. And at CCAD, we ha- require them to Ooh, do an internship great. and a lot of students end up doing more than one, um, but it is it's good to try to focus them on a, yeah. a firm that might have both um, experiences. I think the D- other benefit of doing that co-op is you get to understand different firms, not only size, so it's very different, as you can imagine, working for a firm of 12 than it mm-hmm. is a firm of 100. Right. And um, and some firms specialize in certain areas, like maybe just healthcare versus a firm mm-hmm. like ours, which um, we have many different um, sector specialties. So I think for an intern, being able to hop around and get those different experiences will help them understand where they really want to take their career, mm-hmm. at least for that first big opportunity. Um, I think it's a great experience from both, from an employer standpoint and and from that um, co-op's right. perspective. What do you think, you know, we, we talk a little bit about um, soft skills in um, education, <laughs> uh, but there's soft skills and technical skills that you might be looking for um, for students to have when they start. Are, mm-hmm. are there things that really stand out to you as really important? Yes, there are. There are. <laughs> We're both like chomping at the bit, like, who's going to answer? I want to answer. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I always kind of, I've learned, you know, a long time ago that, you know, you should hire based on the soft skills. Hire the personality. Yeah. Technical skills can be taught. You know, if they, you know, a student has made it that far, you know, they've passed a lot of bars. So I'm not as worried about the technical side of things. Mm-hmm. But what I am worried about is their ambition, their drive, their ability to collaborate, their ability to, you know, just communicate and you know give as much as they can to the the effort the project the team whatever we need them to work on Mm -hmm. Um, someone that can't do that is not someone I want to hire but someone that's willing to do that and can do that you know I'll hire every day the key is showing the willingness like the Mm -hmm. the the motivation to learn and um and not come in dictating what you want out of it, but but just a, a willingness to, to learn. Learning um, how to ask a question, yeah. I think, is yeah. um, something that I always struggled yeah. with. Yeah. And in my do your internships, research right? Like, how do I ask a question about <laughs> this thing I don't know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's very scary. It is. Oh, my gosh, I know. It, sometimes people will ask, if you could do it over mm-hmm. again, what would you change? Um, actually, that 40 under 40, that was mm-hmm. one of the questions. And yeah. my response was um, to not be so afraid mm-hmm. to ask those questions when you're an intern, yeah. because we don't expect you're going to know it all. Right. Sometimes we, I think what we do forget is is how um, how long it takes to, to build that knowledge and that skill. So if nothing else, it's just, oh, 
That's right. You might not know that. Let me explain it to you. So asking those questions. And then I think too, in the interview process, it's so important to just be yourself. Don't come in trying to be someone you're not as far as that soft skill is concerned. Mm -hmm. Just have a conversation and and be genuinely interested in the firm that you're interviewing with. Yeah. Do you see different project types um, becoming more demanding or growing faster than other project types right now? It's always changing. So yeah. the market, you know, really we respond to market pressure and certain sectors grow and certain sectors shrink. Um, and that changes by geography. So things are a little bit different for me in Cincinnati than they are for Kerry in Columbus. So Brian down in our Charlotte office, you know, he has a completely different set of, of market pressures that he has to respond to. So, you know, for me right now, we're seeing, you know, multifamily residential is still a very hot commodity where I'm understanding other parts of the country. It's not. It's it's slowing down. Um, industry, industrial type work is getting really hot. And that usually includes both manufacturing, you know, distribution, but also office. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm trying to think of the other, the other big one that we're seeing growth in is more like redevelopment, mixed use, like mm-hmm. retail, like, you know, big retail centers that have failed. And how do you, what do you do with those? And people are really starting to plan that and, uh, you know, want to execute these projects. So, you know, we're seeing those, those sectors all kind of active right now in, in Cincinnati. I, you know, I mimic, I think, everything Seth just said. Um, You know, for a long time now, I would say three to four years, we've said that the residential market is going to slow, and I think it it will here eventually. Um, And and Cincinnati is a little bit behind Columbus um, in that respect. But, you know, I feel like every time I turn the corner, there's a new residential project going up. Um, So it'll be interesting, I think, to see what happens to some of these residential properties that are maybe, you know, B properties and how do we transform those to still be relevant. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if you mentioned this, but um, the malls, you know, whether it's strip center or um, indoor malls, how do we uh, repurpose those buildings so that they're relevant again. Um, So yeah, I I don't know that, you know, if we had a crystal ball, if only, (laughs) but I think the one thing that keeps um, us at at an advantage is maybe, um, well, being nimble for sure and being able to follow that market like Seth talked about, but also um, all the services that we provide. So one thing that I, I meant to say earlier is it's not just about interior design and architects. I feel like the more you can think holistically about design, period, the better mm-hmm. off you are because you know, the landscape architects bring something to the table that both architect and interior designer don't. Um, we have experiential design in-house, and that is a big um, piece of the pie when we're trying to talk about holistic design, and it's how the space or environment, how you're experiencing that space mm-hmm holistically. So right. um, I think the more you're thinking about design in that way, the more successful the project will be and mm-hmm. the more successful you will be. Sometimes it's not markets that we have to respond to, but it's um, either trends, whether it's you know construction technology. I mean, I've had so many more conversations about modular construction mm-hmm. in the last six months than I've had in the previous six years. Um, As Carrie said, experiential design and how that space feels, there's so much more awareness. um, And especially when we do, you know, a lot of workplace um, Mm -hmm. tends to really spend money on that stuff. And, you know, we're, tell the companies, companies exactly, branding. All kinds of different um, fields, graphic design, UX, UI, right. But we do it all in house, mm-hmm. and we can do it all in one package. And yeah. just the quality and the the way those come across yeah. are just at yeah. a different level. Right. Yeah. That was the first time I ever heard interior architecture was when I was at a uh, interviewing for a co op at an a, uh, uh, architecture firm. They mm-hmm. did a lot of healthcare, and yeah. they called it interior architecture because right. they felt really strongly as a firm that you know it, it wasn't just it's it's all part of the the building. It's all part of the design and the yeah. architecture of the yeah. project, whether it's inside or outside. So mm-hmm. they really wanted to make that clear to as a service that they offered. And it was just an interesting perspective, um, you know, that I didn't really think about until that moment. Yeah. And and you don't hear it a lot for programs, but I do think it really is about, like you're saying, about the spatial condition and how are we designing that human experience, whether or not that's at a, on a park bench or in a hospital. That's exactly right. Carrie, could you tell us about your path and growth with M&A, but also just within your career? Yes. Um, so I interned, um, so I w- went, I graduated from The Ohio State University. And while there, I interned with both Moody Nolan and Design Group, um, both fairly large, medium to large size firms in Columbus. And um, 
And then at graduation, I decided I wanted to, you know, have a little bit different experience um, and work for a firm that was a little bit smaller. Um, and so I worked for Maleka Architecture for about four years. And the interesting piece about that is they didn't have any interior designer. Um, there had been no designer there that had worked in the past. And so they really weren't sure what to do with me. Like, okay, so what do you do? You know, like, how do we integrate you into what we do? And and so for a long time, I... Um, I was just working with architects, trying to figure out their language and and act like I knew more than I did because there was a lot I didn't know. Um, and so I kept an architectural dictionary at my desk next to me, and I every time was told to do something like detail this parapet, I'm like, sure, yeah, I will get right on that. <laughs> and then as soon as he walked away, I'm like, what is a parapet? <laughs> so I think there's a lot. Back to my earlier statement about you know I um, I think I wouldn't be so afraid to ask those questions um, because. I probably spent too much time just trying to figure out what the thing was than how to actually do it. So um, I would never take that experience back, though. That four years, I think, helps really set my path moving forward. It, um, a high design firm with a very traditional um, background and sensibility, classical architecture. And so I, I did learn a lot there. Um, from there, I went to WSA, another small firm, a little bit different mentality, uh, a little bit a uh, younger group of folks. Uh, and they did have an interior design path um, already sort of set. Um, so I was able to sort of sculpt that a little bit. Um, there was no real set program there or department. It was um, actually when I came in, I was the only interiors person there as well. Uh, they had so you hired had to forge your own path. Kind quite of, a bit. I, yeah. It was a little different there because they had still the the shell of an interior design department, right? So they had all the finishes. They had a library where mm-hmm. at Moleka there was none of that, and I had to build all of that and try to figure out who the reps were and that whole story. But um, and and WSA has um, a, a great interior design. Um, department there now. So I had a lot of great experience there and then was given the opportunity to join MA um, kind of to do that same thing, to start the department and didn't really know what that looked like. And I think that's a, that's another learning moment in, in my career is to definitely go after the things you're most afraid of um, because I was terrified and I think I was making every excuse to not join MA because I was really comfortable where I was and it was yeah. easy and I wasn't really looking for the job. It just sort of came to me. Uh, so um, I just finally, I think, convinced myself that I needed to, to try it, and it was a great opportunity that I shouldn't pass up. And um, I'm glad you did. Yeah, <laughs> me too, me too. <laughs> um, but really, it's I think I wouldn't be where I am if it weren't for the leadership at MA. Our president, Mark Daniels, I think has incredible vision and has um, an entrepreneurial spirit and is always telling all staff, which I think has trickled down to any of the leadership team that now works um, with him, that um, you know, if you if you want to do something, let's figure out a way to do it. We have to make sure it makes sense for the firm, but yeah. um, he really gives a lot of rope, and the firm as a whole now, I think because of that, gives a lot of rope. So, um, you know, it's there's there's a lot of hard work that you have to put into that, but I think if you've got the drive and the motivation and the right leadership group, mm-hmm. um, magic can happen. Supportive environment. So yeah, I yeah. think. As a female coming in now, so now I'm proud to say that we're 50-50 ownership, um, women and men. Oh, that's awesome. um, Which is really exciting, um, really exciting. Um, But when I started with the firm, I think, I mean, there was, I I don't know how many women were part of MA at the time, but it was a small group of us. Um, And and now I think the firm almost as a whole might be like 40, 60, close to 50-50, which is really exciting. It is 50-50, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's really exciting. and I think there's an opportunity for me to help uh, women, um, young or senior, find a place because it's a it is a male dominated industry between construction, construction yeah. um, all of our consultants, engineering. I mean, it's certainly male dominated, and mm-hmm. and so it's a it's a different challenge to be a woman. Were you amongst a driving that table. force in um, cultivating that, or um, you know, as one of the you know? few women starting yeah Yeah, I think I I I would say yes now certainly not taking all the credit but I am involved in a lot of the hiring and so um I don't think I ever said my goal is to have a 50 50 split but it just sort of organically happened that way Mm -hmm. um 
So I think that's really exciting and the path ahead uh, for not just our firm, but women in this field in general, I think is exciting. Um, Seth, what what was your process of growing through uh, your internship experiences and job, different types of jobs and landing where you are now? Well, um, my very first co-op, um, so as my sophomore year of college, uh-huh. I was 19, was back in my hometown of Milan, Ohio, and it was for a sole proprietor. One architect, he did everything. So the exposure I got to every facet of the business of architecture was, you know, one on one. I got to see it all. Mm -hmm. And it was that moment I knew this is what I wanted to do. Um, The best piece of advice he gave me was take a stab in the dark. You know, even if you're 80 percent right, you know, Mm -hmm. that's better than not trying at all and being zero percent right. True. So yeah. he kind of, he got me over that hump of being afraid to do something. And I've tried to pass it on to younger people that kind of, you know, they feel like they're, you know, they don't know something, they don't want to try it because they're going to screw up. And I was like, well, you might screw up, but you're not going to screw up completely. Yeah. You're going to screw up a little bit, yeah. but the part that's right is what we can build on. Yeah. Um, and then I went out to um, to Massachusetts and uh, co-opted at a, a city, actually had an architecture department, which was <laughs> a completely different way of doing things. Interesting. Um, yeah. Then I went out cool. west coast to San Diego, and it was a, a sculptor turned architect that had a, like an eight-person practice, and it was very odd and very, cool very in interesting. And when <laughs> when the surf, you know, when the surf was up, you know, half the uh-huh. office didn't come in until about ten o'clock, and nice. it was a completely different environment. <laughs> but but yeah. how did you leave that day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, San Diego is very expensive. Oh, yeah. true, yeah. <laughs> um, and then my last co-op was in Cleveland at a very large corporate firm, and you know I hated that. I, I absolutely yeah. hated that environment and that mentality. Yeah. Um, so after college, I actually didn't have a job, and I was living at home, and uh, you know putting my application out there, Monster.com, and all you know all the the typical stuff back in at that time. And one day, I just randomly checked my spam mailbox. And I saw this said opportunity in Columbus, Ohio. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what that is. And turns out it was a uh, job at MA Architects. Oh, so wow. I drove down there, did the interview. <laughs> you check that spam <laughs> no I kidding. Where would we be now? Well, that's another lesson. <laughs> Make sure you've got lesson. your emails yeah. double checked, triple checked. <laughs> Um, one of the things you said was, re- is re- I think, really good is, you know, part of the internship process is just learning what types of places you don't want to work exactly. in, too, right? Like exactly. you're <laughs> big, corporate. Yes. big corporate or even the types of places you want to work at, like a surf shack. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that right. sounds yeah. fun. And, and <laughs> what it taught me and what I saw at MA was, you know, we weren't a small firm. We weren't a large firm, but we... <sighs> There's two things. It was really that uh, it was like a family. Everyone cared about each other, and Mm -hmm. they would do things after work together, you know, whether it be a happy hour or other types of events. Um, You know, open mic night, we would all go, and one guy would play and sing, and we'd all go just cheer for him, you know. It was was so, you know, it just felt like a good, you know, environment to to be in. But um, like Carrie said, if you have the ambition and the drive, they give you the rope to build something. And... uh, you know, without that, I, I I wouldn't be where I was today in Cincinnati without that rope to build, you know, first of all, the project portfolio that led us down to Cincinnati. Um, but, you know, just my individual role as a director, you know, first as an associate, then as a director in the company, you know, yeah, it's a lot of hard work and you have to do it yourself. But, yeah. you know, I was never told no. And I've always appreciated that. And that's probably the biggest thing I value about the company. It also kind of goes back to the soft skills mm-hmm. discussion because it sounds like you really have cultivated a family mm-hmm. atmosphere. We talk about the CCAD family a lot here, and it really is about like how you fit in with the people. And we mentioned it a little bit, I know earlier, just being um, doing your homework before you go into mm-hmm. an interview scenario. Um, I think a lot of the questions, actually, Kelly, that you asked us today would be really interesting questions if an intern were to ask that. So mm-hmm. if an interior designer walked into a firm and said, uh, can you tell me you know, how the interaction is between the, inter- the, the architects and the interior designers? Mm-hmm. If an in, or if a potential employee came in and asked me that question, I think I'd be blown away. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, because that's just important. That's a yeah, important thing. It's to a know. great right. and, and how this yeah, if if they're true. studio based firm, right? Um, how do the studios interact with each other, and um, does the interior department really work mm-hmm. individually and siloed, or are they integrated with other studios? Can you explain how that how that works at your firm? Like, I would be, right. I think, blown away by those questions. Yeah, the interior designer that we just hired did ask a variation of that, 
if you remember the first time we talked to her, how. Mm. Oh, and, she right. Yeah, she did. And she You're did. Right. And it was kind of impressive because, yeah, she'd been out of school for, you know, mm-hmm. a couple of years. But, you know, she was she understood that. And because yeah. she came from a firm that had both interior designers and architects and wanted to know how, how that worked. And, you know, I told her that, you know, we're all on the same team. We're you're part of the project team. You're not you're not on your own little island. Yeah. Getting the experience yeah. under your belt, it's the hardest thing. And these are really the good because I think these are the kinds of things it's hard. We can't teach that at yeah. CSAD. We can't teach those experiences or our, you know, company culture. Mm-hmm. You can't learn that at school. You really have to go and yeah. experience that on your own. So I, I think too, um, actually, I, I just did this last week with a student who uh, wanted to do sort of a mock interview. I, I had already said we're, we don't have any positions open, and I thought it was really impressive that she asked if I would be willing to to just give a mock interview. And so now I don't know how many people would say, sure, I'll, I have time to do that. But an HR department might. Um, yeah. And if you know that yeah. there's not an opportunity, I think, one, it shows a different level of interest. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I understand that there's no job opportunity, but it gives you experience. I just thought that was interesting. So, of course, I did it because I'm like, no one's asked me that before. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> if someone expresses interest in working for us, I do the same thing. I'm I, I say, well, we don't have a position. You know, if that's the case, I say, we don't have an open position. But, you know, I look at the resume, I made, you know, kind of make those initial mm-hmm. decisions. And if I like what I see, I was like, I, I do want to talk to you. I want to meet you in person. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, there's been on more than one occasion where I've done that. And months later, I've called mm-hmm. them back and because and, we yeah. did have an opening. Right. Um, and just getting to know people. And, you know, the, the world is very small in architecture and interior design in Columbus and in Cincinnati. So, yeah. you know. So everyone, just because you hear no first doesn't right. mean you won't. Yeah. It's a small yeah, world. Yeah. Everyone knows each other. So yeah. even if I never have a, a, you know, open position for that person, mm-hmm. someone at another firm can call me up. Hey, do you know anyone? And I'll mm-hmm. say, yeah, I got this person yeah. right here and yeah. send them over the That's resume. So, too. you know, it's all maintain those relationships and make those connections, um, especially when you're coming out of school or still in school. And that yeah, can don't burn pay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that can pay dividends in the future. I actually, that's a really good point, too. I was just thinking about our firm and, and the folks that we've hired somewhat recently. And um, the girl actually who is at our front desk right now, um, I f- kind of feel like she's our office mom, but um, she graduated with a degree, like a marketing background. And she came in and was like, you know, I, I love what this firm does. I love what I see on social media, on your website. And I feel like your culture would just fit me. And she couldn't find an opportunity and said, I'm willing to come in and take this position and um, asked, do you think there'd be any potential transition to a marketing position? Um, and we said, there very well maybe. And we are now talking to her. She's been with us for, I don't know, I think maybe two or two and a half years. Oh, wow. And so she's got great experience. She's gotten to know the firm. And if anyone knows anything about front desk people, <laughs> they like run the firm, basically, <laughs> right? Yeah. Anyone that's coming in and out. So she has yeah. learned um, all of our clients, all of our reps, all of our people inside and out, um, and it has had the opportunity to help the marketing team as she's had time available, which has proved to the marketing team that she's got an ability. So I guess all I'm saying is, like, to your point, Kelly, the first no doesn't mean Mm -hmm. no, or look for other avenues. Or or what a great experience for somebody who wants to be in marketing to to learn the culture. I mean, that's so interesting, just looking for other job opportunities that could be aligned with your skill set. Even if yeah. she didn't have the ability to transition within our firm, um, which we're hope- hopeful that will happen, she still can put on her resume the work that she did in marketing right. while she was with us because right. she's helped with an awful lot. She manages our um, – well, we don't need to get into it, but she <laughs> manages an awful lot for us and helps yeah. the marketing te- team quite a bit. So if she wanted to you know, shift gears and go to another marketing firm, mm-hmm. she has some, some great resume builders. Yeah. Learning what you're – personal skill set and those soft skills and things like that really are and what you really have to contribute I think is hard for students to learn how to articulate yes um and when you're scanning through applicants how how do you how do you get an inkling that someone might be a good fit I I mean 
a breadth of experience. Like uh-huh. if they're a student or if they're someone that have just have a few years experience, I look for, you know, someone that has interned in a variety of places, different size firms. So they've, they have started building that knowledge of what maybe they can, can't do, like, don't like where they fit. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's one of the big things that I, that, that jumps out at me. I'll say that. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times, you know, how they, and it sounds like kind of nitpicky, but how they like format and lay out everything. And it's like, it's like how they communicate right. visually is really important because that's what mm-hmm. we do. Yeah. And so if they aren't communicating very clearly in a visual manner on the resume, mm-hmm. you know, that's yeah. kind of a red flag. Yeah. yeah. I agree with all of that. I think cover letters are a big deal too. Um, you know, there's been so many cover letters that I've received that are addressed to the wrong person mm-hmm. or they still have remnants of another firm name on there. Oh. And Oops. it, you know, yeah. I understand that you're, you're probably sending these out to a handful of firms, but that doesn't make you feel check good. your work. Yeah. Check yeah. your work. Yeah. Um, so I think that for sure, um, the creativity and, and, um, I think the resume is, mm-hmm. you know, is it clean? Is it easy to read? All of yeah. those things programs you know i think different programs are easy to learn there's so many online tools now so what are you, you, what primary um, program are you guys functioning um, in? all of our construction documents are done in revit, revit. Um, so yes some are still in cad but we prefer them not to be um, so yes revit for That's sure good. and then the adobe suite know. yeah yeah adobe suite is, adobe suite is um, absolute it's pretty easy to pick up though so it's yeah. not if someone didn't have that on their resume i wouldn't it wouldn't be mm-hmm. a no-go yeah. um well sometimes i think at ccad um students forget to put that on their resume because they, they learn it first year yeah. they just assume right and that, i think that's a good reminder that no that's not a given yeah and the adobe suite mm-hmm. um knowing sense. knowing like each one of those programs i think yeah, is one, is powerful what you should right. use right. for right yeah yeah. I think um, hand drawing. Oh, we forgot to talk about that. Yeah. So important. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. <laughs> it, good. It, we still teach hand drawing. Thank here. God. Good. Because, yeah. you know, I, there's something to being in a meeting with your client mm-hmm. and being able to sketch something right in front of his eyes, his or her eyes, right, and, right. you know, bring that, your thought to life on mm-hmm. the paper right away is. Right. Because you know, often what you bring to a client meeting is not what you discuss. You're not discussing that final thing. So you're discussing yeah. progress mm-hmm. and changes. So how do you draw in front yeah. of someone? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Carrie, I mean, she's she's amazing at it. She'll just mm-hmm. roll out a piece of trace and start sketching, and oh, wow, we have a design now, and this yeah. is way better than you know what we had before. Yeah. Until Seth says, "No, that doesn't meet code, but it's beautiful." <laughs> no, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, well. No, that's why there's a balance, right? <laughs> right. Um, right. No, I mean it's all important, but I do think that hand sketching there, you need to be able to have that ability in front of a client when they're talking about a change. You can't just nod your head and say, "I understand what you're saying." You have to show them that you understand mm-hmm. what you're saying and yeah. give them options on the spot. So um, I I think that is so important. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, one other thing that came to mind when we were talking about skills, um, soft skills, presentation. So I think it's something that's often overlooked. And so many young folks have the tendency to say um and like a lot. Yes. And it, presentation skills. it is a habit that you have got yes. to break. I know all of us still do it. There's There are still times when we all do it. But in a presentation, you could have the greatest presentation in from in front of them, and then those verbal skills are not great, and um, and there's no faith anymore in the product that you're presenting. Right. So um, I because I, you're kind of like you know kind of like it, it's kind of like awesome and like I think it's great sort of <laughs> yeah. So one thing that our firm actually is doing, I think it started maybe this past year, is Toastmasters, and I never realized how inexpensive it is. Oh wow! And there is a student. I believe, I hope I'm not misspeaking, but I think there's a student um, Toastmasters program and it's really, it is really inexpensive. I think it's like $60 or something for a six month program and the skills that you learn and to be able to put that on your resume Mm -hmm. as, you know, I understand that it's important to be able to give presentations and I know day one, I might not be presenting in front of clients, but it's an important skill that I know I need to to learn. So I've gone through Toastmasters or I am considering what do you think about going through a program? You know, just sort of asking those questions. I think it would be uh, impressive to to hear that too. And and one of the first things they teach you is is know your audience you're presenting to. Mm-hmm. So if you're making a design presentation to 
a client versus the contractor as well. Right. Sure. It, it, you change how you present. You and mean. yeah, you have to understand and know and intuit yeah. what, you know, what's important to each person that you're presenting to mm-hmm. and making sure you can hit those points during the presentation. Yeah. You know, the other thing I wanted to pick your brain is something you were starting to talk about, Seth, is graphic design mm-hmm. and how embedded graphic design is in the architecture and interior field. And I talk about that a little bit in um, in school, right? And how important it is to understand hierarchy and line weight and mm-hmm. line typography. Weights. That's a pet peeve of mine is <laughs> right. line weights. <laughs> but um, maybe you could talk about how often that um, really is used in the architecture and design mm-hmm. field. All the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Line width, it, we're, like I said before, we're visual. You know, our medium is visual. So if we can't communicate what we are designing accurately and clearly, then we failed. But even on the design presentation mm-hmm. side, not not yeah. the technical yeah. Pre- yeah, presentation, right. but the design presentation, it's the same thing. If mm-hmm. you can't sell your idea to the client, then it's not going to get built. There's so many layers of graphic design. I think there's so many spitting in my head right now from wayfinding, whether it's signage um, within a building or on a site uh, leading you to the building. I mean, hospitals, I think, is the best example of wanting great wayfinding. You're there for a reason that you want to be focusing on other than what, yeah, how do I right. get to this room, right? Some of the or this greatest, wing. greatest designs are things that are so intuitive and you yes. don't notice, right? Mm-hmm. right. So right. how do you make that? And then experiential design, like we talked a little bit about too. I think the, the graphic acts aspect to that. Right. Environmental design and experiential design has just come so far over the last mm-hmm. few years. I feel like in integrating technology and it's only going to become even more important that it's integrated. So yeah. um, that's exciting. It's yeah. exciting to see what Do you guys see any use or have you um, dabbled in any of the VR we kind have. of new Seth, new stuff? Sure has a lot to say about that. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, we have. We uh, it, it started as, um, you know, just basic research research and uh, development just to understand what's out there. So, it, you know, low barrier to entry cost wise. And we have, you know, several people that are talented and understand kind of just, they just understand that stuff. So um, since we work in Revit, we're creating, you know, these these spaces in 3D already. So it's not that big of a leap to actually bring it into VR if you have the right programs and the right, you know, know-how, which, mm-hmm. you know, essentially the, the James, he's our, our main IT guy, but he's also done a lot of the VR work in conjunction with Doug, who's our senior vi- visualization artist. So between the two of them, they took a Revit model of a project that uh, we were working on down in the Cincinnati office brought that into the software, you know, put the textures on it, all the materials, and, um, you know, then piped it over to the VR system. And it was amazing. And so, you know, kind of had this cool. idea. It's like, well, what can we do with this? Um, you know, we're a business. How can we make money with this? Um, and I went to one of our clients that they do a lot of multifamily projects around Cincinnati and, uh, you know, sale, selling their units or, you know, renting their units mm-hmm. um, is key. And this project hadn't been built yet. So how do you sell something that doesn't exist? Um, so instead of having just renderings or just 2D mm-hmm. pictures, I pitched the idea of creating a virtual reality showroom for their units uh, wow. for this upcoming project. They loved it. We uh, put together a whole package of all the different unit types, materials, furnishings. You know, there was a laptop with a half, you know, half cup of coffee, and you know, yeah. it looked lived in. Yeah. And uh, use that as a set. So they put that in a trailer out on the construction site, and were able to sell way more units ahead of time pre-sale. than mm-hmm. that. Their pre-sale wow. units were. Um, I don't know the exact number, but uh, right. significantly ahead of when they don't do that. Um, so I think that that's that's, that's a future I'd... that as a business, you can think of where VR is going to go. Yeah. Um, you know, and then there's augmented reality AR, mm-hmm. which I think will is almost an evolution on that sales technique because mm-hmm. we could create the building virtually. Um, but with augmented reality, you could go out to the construction site and put the glasses on and see it in place, in sight, in in where it is. And that's that's a whole nother level that's that we crazy. haven't even tapped into yet. <laughs> you can be in a virtual environment or an augmented reality environment, either one, and you can start creating the space and picking furniture, placing it. You can move then walk the through around. it, mm-hmm. move the chair, move oh, the gosh. wall, move that's the doors, um, change colors. And, you know, so on the design side, that's like mind blowing. But then for our clients, <laughs> you know, we can have them immersed in the space and try out different colors, designs, you know, just with a, you know, flick of a wrist, boom, it changes. Wow. The next five years are going to be um, amazing changes. I was at a conference last week and um, one of the guys said, and it kind of made sense. He's like, we're about 30 percent 
of the way through the transition from analog to digital in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. So we're not even halfway through it yet. So what? Yet. I will bring up again. I do you still um, think that hand drawing will continue to be used? I, I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's a foundation. Yeah. There's so much emotion in design, too, mm-hmm. um, you know, that I feel that's why soft skills are going to become even more important, I think, in the next 10 years. Is there something that, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about robotics and what, you know, how, how are they going to, how is the, yeah, yeah, AI, how is it going to take over our industry and what do we have to be prepared for? But um, I guess what's then our value? And I f- really do feel like that mm-hmm. soft skill um, and emotion is something that can't be delivered there. One more thing on the hand drawing. I, I, like I said, it's a foundation. So if you can draw well by hand, then that's going to translate yeah. to other right. other mediums and other right. ways. So I, I, I haven't seen too many people that were great artists digitally that weren't already great artists by, you know, by hand in some way, shape, or form. They might not have a refined, you know, way to draw, right. but they had a, 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 there's a physical connection between their hand and their mm-hmm. brain and how they express. And that translates because you're still entering it by hand. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a definite right. correlation there. I always have felt one of the most important processes is that programming phase where you're really understanding the client. So in workplace, computer programming. Right, right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, Project program. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and really understanding that that company and you know what they're trying to achieve. And you know we'll send out questionnaires and to to all staff, right, whoever company we're working with, and we gather all this data that we use ultimately for that program. And then we sit down and we have in- interviews, personal interviews with each department. And we always find out things in those interviews that we never find out in the hard data. And I think it's a very similar conversation, right? When you sit in a room with people and you're reading faces, you understand the dynamic, uh, whatever it is that's happening right. and, and why maybe the adjacencies need to be a little bit different or it might spark a question that you are never going to get by filling out a survey or having right. it all automated. So that that personal component, I still feel like that's why yes. it's so important. Well, it's being connected. Pointing up or bringing up um, design research as yeah. a, another tool mm-hmm. in the toolbox mm-hmm. that is so important for clients to be able to understand yeah. what clients need. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I think what I was talking about doesn't replace that process. Right. I think, no, yeah, I think that yeah. is yes, still, to your, you it, said. it's learning how to translate yes. that data That's into right. the program That's right. um, to yeah. get those yeah. you know hundreds of iterations. Yep. Yeah. Although I will say, I do see students, some who just really gravitate towards really technical things, right? They, they don't like to draw, mm-hmm. um, but they're great technical um, I was computer one. skills, I was right? One of those. Yeah. Um, and I so, was what would you? Well, Seth, maybe what would you say to those students? Because I know we, we say, oh, well, you have to draw and you have to mm-hmm. do research and you have to do all the well, things. Well, you still have right? to do that, <laughs> <laughs> right, right? But I think some just gravitate more towards computer mm-hmm. skills. So maybe you could talk about um, how to navigate that when you're being asked to do so many things at once. Well, if, once I understood the value of, of the hand drawing and mm-hmm. all the stuff that I didn't want to do because I wasn't good at it, once I understood the value of it, then I was a little bit more okay and realizing that I didn't have to be perfect. It didn't have to look as good as yeah. someone else's. But what they what, what the professors wanted me to do was just mm-hmm. develop that part of my brain. Right. Um, and the important thing is the communication of mm-hmm. the idea, right? right? Not necessarily that it is perfect. Right. Or it even looked poche drawing. Good. You know, I mean, quote unquote, I did an air quote, you can't see that. Um, <laughs> but just that understanding. And, and once we got into like, because I learned how to hand draw and uh, hand draft in mm-hmm. school and hand, you know, in high school even. And, uh, and they made us do that for the first year. We couldn't use computers. Um, and we were doing like old school drafting and, mm-hmm. you know, pens with different widths and all that. And I hated every minute of that. But what I learned has translated so well into the computer side of things that, you know, it helped my technical skill in that I know how to make a presentation look really good because I, I was terrible at it doing it by hand, but I can, I learned how to do it. So now I can do it on a right. computer and it looks really good. Right. I think I might add to that, um, that technical side, I think is also the same th- side that enables you to run an office really well. It's, mm-hmm. you've got that technical ability and, um, details right mm-hmm. and so while Which you know come naturally to some people yes, more than others yes know. and so i don't feel like if there was 
a creative maybe person who loved to draw but maybe wasn't so technical sitting in your seat couldn't do it so it seems like one of the goals to take away from the conversation would be try to access what you as a person bring to mm-hmm. the table and yeah. try to figure out how to articulate that whether that's on paper yeah. or in person definitely being yourself and knowing yourself mm-hmm. but also willing i think to stretch you know mm-hmm. because if you come into a firm saying this is what I can do, right? And this and is what I'm good at it. And so, right. where's my spot? <laughs> that's, it. that's not good yeah, either. Right. But knowing your strengths and saying this is, yeah. and and your weaknesses just as much. And saying, you know, I haven't had much experience doing this, but I, I'm open to learning. And I'm that's that's all you want to hear is yeah. that you're willing to learn and stretch. Thanks, Carrie and Seth. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. In. Yes. <laughs> thank you. That's our episode this week. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Another special thanks to Carrie and Seth from m and Architects for joining us. And also a special thanks on the CCAD side to Kelly DeVore for sitting in and being our great guest host. Kelly and her expertise in architecture and interior design was the perfect person to have this conversation with Carrie and Seth. And I'm really happy the way it came out. So Kelly, thank you for giving us your time as well. For you, the listener, thanks for tuning in and make sure you subscribe to us or follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash first you hustle. This is going to be our last episode of the 2018-2019 academic year. We'll do a couple episodes for the summer and then we'll be back with you in September for the 2019-2020 academic year. Thanks a lot.